This is another video in the series for Math 1133 for UTSA. Today we're talking about 13.6 applications of integrals. So in the last video, we spent time talking about areas under functions. So like if we wanted this area right here under this graph from A to B, right? So if we do that, well, then we're going to basically be using rectangles. Basically rectangles like this. And we are using one or the other corners of the rectangle is going to make the height and the the width of the rectangle will represent with dx the height will be f of x right that's the uh, the y coordinate on that corner so the the area will be the integral from uh, a to b of f of x dx we talked about that in more detail previously okay so what if we have a function that dips below the x-axis for part of its uh, interval. There's some place where the graph crosses the x-axis and then we make rectangles on the left of that, for example, and that area, well, the, the height is just f of x and the width is dx. So this area is formed by the integral from a to c of f of x dx. Over here though, because the graph dips below the x-axis, the heights aren't actually made by f of x. The height is negative f of x, okay? And of course, the width is still dx. So one way to do this is to say, okay, this area, this is the integral from c to b of the negative of f of x dx, okay? Now, leading into what we do in the next several examples, there's, there's a w different way to look at this that might illuminate something. Up here, what I could do is think of this graph as being the top of the region and the x-axis being the bottom of the region. So I have y equals f of x is the top and y equals 0 is the bottom. So my area is the integral from a to b of f of x minus 0, top minus bottom. Okay, down here same thing i have top minus bottom so f of x minus zero is the integrand okay here we have top minus bottom zero minus f of x that's sort of a common theme top minus bottom okay so if we had something like this where i have two functions and I want the area between them, then what I'll do is I'll need, since my rectangles will look like this, okay, the height of the, of the rectangle is the top minus the bottom, with some error involved, but we talked about that before, when the number of rectangles goes to infinity, but we're not missing anything. So this area will be the integral from A to B of F of X minus G of X dx, top minus bottom, okay? If we had this situation where the two graphs cross each other, well, then there's some place in the middle here, let's say we could call that C perhaps, right? In this region, F is the top, right? G is below, F is above. So this area, this will be the integral from A to C of F of X minus G of X dx. In this region, though, since they've, they've crossed, g is on top and f is at the bottom. So for this one, we're going to have the integral from c to b of g of x minus f of x. So when you want to find the area, the overarching theme is top minus bottom. And if the function, uh, well, one function crosses the other, or the function crosses the x-axis or whatever, then you need to do more than one chunk. But basically, top minus bottom is the overarching theme. So this section is all about applications, so what can we do with this? So we're going to look at consumer surplus and producer surplus, what those things are, and how to calculate them. So I have an axis set up for quantity and price. I'm going to draw a generic supply curve and demand curve. So supply, something like that. Demand, something like that. Supply, demand. Okay, 
So you can see that there's a place where they intersect. So that's going to be our equilibrium quantity, which I guess I'll mark like that. And then I have my equilibrium price, something like that. This is the quantity that is at equilibrium, and this is the price that is at equilibrium. Okay. And let's uh, make sure it's clear. These are not lines as in a function or an equation, just, just indicating a location. And there's the equilibrium point right here. Okay. Now, this region above that dashed line, above the equilibrium price, but below the demand curve, this is called the consumer surplus. Why is it called that? Well, basically, this represents the money that consumers were willing to spend but didn't have to. So let's say we've got some, some widget, right? And let's say, I don't know, it's a really fancy toaster. And let's say that um, the going price is, say, $40, okay? And up here, the place where the price uh, for uh, the, the demand curve is at a maximum, let's say it's uh, $70, for example, okay? So this section of the graph right here, this represents that one person or small group of people who are willing to pay $70, Okay, now they didn't have to. They spent $40 for the fancy toaster because that's what the price on the shelf is. They spent $40 to get the toaster that they wanted. But they were willing to spend $70. So they got to keep $30. Okay, and then over here, say uh, this person here, or small group of people or whatever, they were willing to say, spend, say, uh, what would that be like? $60 or $65. Let's say, let's say $60. The, the scale's off. Well, you know, let's make it $55. $55. Okay, so this person was willing to spend $55, but they didn't have to because the price is 40, so they got to keep $15. So all of these little rectangles, these are representative of a person or a small group of people who were willing to spend more than the going rate, but they didn't have to. They got to keep that money, okay? So this whole region together is called the consumer surplus, okay? The consumer surplus, and that's always going to be the area between the top, so we got the top of the region minus the bottom of the region, okay? So this will be the integral from zero to the equilibrium quantity, okay? That's the, the interval on the horizontal axis that we go over of whatever the demand curve is, okay, dq minus, well, the bottom of that region is the equilibrium price, in this case 40, but I'll leave it generic. The equilibrium price, dq. This is getting in the way. Put that here. Okay. So this formula gives you the consumer surplus. You don't have to memorize it as a formula, but I'm just recognizing top of the region minus bottom of the region. Okay. Top minus bottom. That's that's all we're doing. Now, what about this region here? Okay. This is the money that the manufacturers of the of the toaster wanted uh well that they do get let's put it that way so let's say um there's some manufacturer say here right and they were willing to produce a certain number of the widget when the price was say was at 15 right at 15 they go yeah we will make those to sell but we don't sell them for $15. We sell them for $40. So this money represents the extra $25 that that manufacturer gets, okay? Because they're selling, say, to the people who are willing to pay this amount. That's the number of them that gets sold. And then those people get to keep that money, but these producers get to get that extra profit. They needed this profit to be solvent. Like, we're not going to do it without that. So if the curve were different, if the demand curve were more like this, then the equilibrium would be here, and this manufacturer would not get into the business of making the widgets at all. But since the equilibrium is where it is, this manufacturer gets to make the widget. They get their, their necessary profit in order to be solvent, but they also get the extra profit because the going rate is the $40 or whatever it is. So this area... This is representative of the extra profit that all the manufacturers get because the going rate is more than they need to break even. So this area 
let's put it over here, this area is the producer's surplus. And this will be the integral from zero to the equilibrium quantity because we're still going over this interval horizontally. But now we're doing a top minus bottom. So the equilibrium price, that you know, y equals PE minus y equals S of Q. I said y equals, it's really p equals, but we often think of the vertical coordinate as big y. So this will be the equilibrium price minus the supply curve, whatever that happens to be, dq. So as with the consumer surplus, this is a formula for the producer surplus. But again, you don't have to think of it as being a formula. You don't need to memorize it, because what we're really doing is top minus bottom to get that region. Okay, so let's look at uh, an example of that. So let's find the consumer and producer surpluses given D of Q equals 120 minus 1 4th Q squared and S of Q equals 3 Q squared. So let's see, I'm, I'm going to just sketch this out real quick down here just so we have a, a way to refer to it as we're working this out. It's, but it's going to be the same thing, pretty much. And they're both quadratic, so that's convenient. So something like that, something like that. Here is the equilibrium quantity. Here is the equilibrium price. And we want to look for the consumer surplus. That's the region up here. And then the producer surplus. That's the region down here. Okay. It doesn't really matter which one we do first. But what we do need is we need to know what is that equilibrium point. We need QE and PE. So the first thing we do is say, well, I need to solve the equation. And I guess... I was thinking about running out of room, but I'm not too worried about that. Okay, so 120 minus 1 4th Q squared equals 3 Q squared. The first thing I'm going to do, just because I think I'll make things slightly easier overall, is multiply both sides by 4 so I don't have to deal with any fractions, at least not yet. So uh, 480 minus Q squared equals 12 q squared. Then I can add q squared to both sides. So 480 equals 13 q squared. And then I can divide by 13 on both sides. So 480 over 13 equals q squared. And in fact, what I'm going to do, because I, I, I don't want to run out of room, is uh, let's do this. So then q equals the square root of 480 over 13 which we probably want a decimal for that. So square root of 480 divided by 13, I get 6.076. And three decimal places is probably good enough. Okay, so that is my equilibrium quantity. So now I need the equilibrium price. In fact, let's put a little, little E there. Okay, so... The equilibrium price, well, this will be, I just take this quantity and plug into either one of the functions. I'll use the, the supply function because that's probably a little bit easier. So S of the square root of 480 over 13. So three times that squared. So three times the square root of 480 over 13 squared. So three times 480 over 13. So 1440 over 13, you get 110.769. Okay, so now I'm ready to set up my first integral. So to find the consumer surplus, with the integral from zero to the equilibrium quantity, the 6.076, of the demand curve because that's the top minus the equilibrium price because that's the bottom. So this will be 120 minus 1 4th Q squared minus 110.769 DQ. Okay. So this will be the integral from 0 to 6.076. I'm going to combine like terms, 120 minus the 110. So that's what, 
31, I believe. Yeah, if I'm rounding, if I'm rounding a bit. So uh, 9.231 minus 1 fourth Q squared DQ. Okay, so that's going to equal 9.231 Q minus 1 twelfth Q cubed evaluated at 0 and 6.076. Okay, so I can evaluate uh, the antiderivative at the two endpoints. So 9.231 times 6.076 minus 1 12th times 6.076 cubed minus 0. So what is that? What do I get approximately? So I get 37.394. Now, presumably, I didn't say this, but this might be in thousands or, or millions or, or whatever, whatever scale. But let's not worry about that right now. Okay, so now let's look for the producer's surplus. That's this bit down here. Okay, so this will be the integral from 0 to 6.076 of the equilibrium price minus the supply curve, top minus bottom. So 110. 0.769 minus 3q squared. I'm pretty sure that's right. Yeah. Okay. dq. Okay. So this will be... Yeah, I don't need to combine like terms. So in fact, I guess I'll do that here. So this will be 110.769q minus q cubed evaluated at 0 and 6.076. So this will be 110.769 times 6.076 minus 6.076 cubed minus 0. So what do we get from that? Then I get 448 point 270 or 720 actually. Okay, so that is uh, basically that calculation. We found both the consumer surplus and the producer surplus. And there's lots of variations on that. Um, if you've taken macroeconomics already, I think macroeconomics, well, whichever one it is, I'm not an economist, uh, then you've seen something like this, but with straight line graphs so that everything is a, a triangle and you just use geometry to calculate uh but now in later econ courses you'll be able to do consumer surplus and producer surplus for for any function that that comes up okay all right what's next okay so this is sort of a more uh, the, the consumer surplus and producer surplus for sort of a specialized type of problem where you would only use it for specific things in an econ class this is m more of a generic thing um that could apply to There'll be more problems like this in the homework. Let's put it that way. Uh, and there'll be different variations on this. So suppose that you're considering a new process for your widget factory that provides savings early on, but also increased costs over time. The savings and costs per month in thousands of US dollars are given by S prime of T equals 100 minus T squared and C prime of T equals T squared plus 5T, respectively, where T equals zero corresponds to the beginning of the first month. Find the total savings if the process has ended as soon as costs begin to exceed savings. So this is a, quite a bit like what we, the example we just did, but with some differences. So of course there's some, right? So you have something like this, and here's time, and here's uh, dollars, I guess. Um, what letter should we use for this? Um, I don't know. Let's say U for US dollars. That's fine. So the savings function looks something like this. Okay. And the cost function looks something like this. Okay, so it looks similar. It's two quadratics that cross. Now, this point right here is where the costs begin to exceed the savings. This is my 
savings function. This is my cost function, right? So here, at this, this point in time for that month, right? Savings are more than cost. So you're going to save this money. And here for that month, the savings are more than the cost. So you're going to save that money. But over here, the extra costs exceed the savings. You're going to lose money. The costs are more. So if we want to say, well, if you stop the process, you switch to something else or go back to what you were doing before, as soon as the savings are less than the cost, or whether it's the cost begin to exceed savings, then you want this area right here. Okay. We're not splitting this into two pieces like the, um, like with the uh, supply and demand. We're just finding the total area there. So we're going to be doing the top, that's the supply, or not supply, sorry, savings, minus the cost, which is not consumer, it's cost, right? Maybe these are not the best letters to choose for this. So this area over here, maybe we don't need to calculate at all. Maybe we will, maybe not, we'll, we'll see. But what we do need is I need to know where is this break-even point? Or, well, I say break-even. At what month? do you not benefit, but also not uh, suffer from this new process? So I need to know what is that? So let's call this, um, I don't know, uh, big T? Yeah, let's say big T. Or you know what, let's say M. M. This is the month that you're going to uh, basically stop because, oh, it's not worth it anymore, right? So I need to know where that is. So I need to solve basically S of T equals, or you know what? These are rates of change. These are these are per month. So these are S prime and C prime, prime, prime. So I need to solve S prime of T equals C prime of T. Okay, so what was that? 100 minus T squared equals T squared plus 5T. Okay, so I'm going to... Uh, Add t squared to both sides and subtract 100 on both sides. So 0 equals 2t squared plus 5t minus 100. Uh, this probably does not factor in a nice way. Um, if I try to use the AC method, um, I don't think it's going to work. So I'm just going to go to the quadratic formula. So t equals uh, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay. And I'm not going to worry about room. I, I have plenty of room um, just down the page. So this equals, I guess I'll put it uh, here. Uh, b is 5, so negative 5 plus or minus the square root 25 minus, well, 4ac, that's 4 times 2 times negative 100. So is that plus 800 minus negative 800 would be plus 800. Yeah, that seems right. All over four. Okay, so I have negative five plus or minus the square root of 825 all over four. Now, of course, of course, um, I, I know I need a positive value because the the place where this crosses is forward in time. Uh, the mathematical model says, oh, yeah, but there's this other one over here that's negative in time. But we're not looking for that one. We're looking forward in time. So I can just throw out the, uh, the minus and not worry about it. So T is approximately, I'll throw this in the calculator, 5.931. Okay, so this is almost the end of the sixth month, right? Six would be the beginning of month number uh, seven, right? So end of month six. So that's when you would stop the process and either go back to what you've been doing before or find something to switch to. So now I want to know, okay, how much money did we save during that time? So I need to integrate this value here. This is approximately 5.931. So I want to integrate from 0 to 5.931 of the top minus the bottom. Okay. So I want 
the integral, let's call this TS, total savings. This is the integral from zero, from zero to 5.931 of S prime of T minus C prime of T dt. Okay, so this is the integral from zero to 5.931 of, was that 100 minus t squared, I think, and then 5t plus t squared. dt, I believe that was correct. Let's check. Yeah, I changed the order, but that, that's fine. Okay, I, I changed the order here, but that's fine. So... This will be uh, the integral from 0 to 5.931 of, let's put this in descending order. So make sure to distribute the minus sign onto both terms. So I have 100 minus t squared minus 5t minus t squared. And I'll combine like terms. So I'll have minus 2t squared minus 5t plus 100. I didn't really need to combine like terms or... or it doesn't matter that much. Oh, I didn't need to put it in descending order. Combined like terms does help a little bit. makes things simpler. Descending order doesn't really matter, but whatever. So this is going to be negative 2 thirds t cubed minus 5 halves t squared plus 100 t evaluated at 0 and 5.931. So this will be negative 2 thirds times 5.931 cubed minus 5 over 2 times 5.931 squared plus 100 times 5.931 all that minus 0 because when you plug 0 in uh, to this polynomial you get 0 because every term has a t value or t as a factor so what do we get from that? 366. And again, we'll assume this is in thousands or millions or whatever, whatever scale we could have chosen at the beginning. 0 0.069. Okay. So that is the total savings. Okay. That's And that's if you stop as soon as the costs start to become too much. Oh, now we're losing money on this. Let's switch to some other process or stop using that piece of equipment or whatever it is, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe it's something like, oh, the costs go up because the equipment you're using has to be replaced or maintained or whatever. Uh, maybe, maybe, or, or maybe it's maintenance and repurchasing equipment it would be a factor, or, or maybe you just have to switch to a different process, whatever it might be. Well, what if I asked a follow-up question? What if I didn't want to stop there? Six months is not that long. And let's, you know, suppose I'm so much worried about um, making extra profit forever. So let's say this. I'm going to move part of this. It's, I'm going I'm to change the drawing a little bit. What if I wanted to do the following and say, well, let's continue this graph out a little bit further. And say, you know, we've built up these savings. We've got this extra money we've been saving. What if we wanted to keep going and ask, well, how far forward should we go in time so that we then lost all of that extra savings because we didn't want to switch processes? How long can we keep this up and then at the end have broken even on, on this change? And now we definitely have to stop doing it because now we're going to start losing money. If we wanted to not change the process, how long could we keep it going without it becoming, oh, well, we have to change that. We're losing so much money on this. We have to, right? Where would that happen? So I'm going to find the total integral and not the total area. I want the integral because I want the negative part to be counted negatively. This is extra savings. This is a loss. So I'm just going to do the integral from zero up to, well, let's call this X. It's something I don't know, right? So the integral from zero to x would give me the the total, the net, the net savings, right? And I could ask, what are the net savings zero? So we could ask, how long can we keep this up? Uh, how about this? How long until we break even? How about that? B 
basically we we deplete the money we had saved up. Well, that'd be the integral. So total savings, this is the integral from zero to X, which we don't know of. Well, that would be the same integrand, wouldn't it? This, this same integrand here. So negative two T squared, squared, negative two T squared minus five T plus 100. dt. Okay. So this is going to be negative two thirds t cubed minus five over two t squared plus 100 t. And it's okay that this endpoint is a variable. That's okay. We don't have to have a number here. So this is going to be, well, if we plug in x, negative two thirds x cubed minus five over two x squared plus 100x minus zero. So the total savings, if you stop at month x, would be that. It's a formula that gives you, well, here's the total savings. Here's, here's what you saved over that time period. And if x is 5.931, then we would make 366, you know, thousand or million or whatever it was. But what if we wanted to keep going until this equals zero? The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides by 6 because I want to clear those fractions out. So I'll have 0 equals negative uh, 4x cubed minus 15x squared plus 600x. Yeah. And then uh, I've got some options. I'm going to factor the right-hand side. Every, uh, every term has an x. Oops, almost almost left one of them in there. Okay, so uh, I can break up these two factors. X is zero, or zero is negative four x squared minus fifteen x plus six hundred. Why do we get zero? What does that represent? Well, that represents ending at x equals zero, or in other words, ending when t equals zero, ending at the beginning of month one, not even doing it at all. So if you don't do the process at all, then you break even. You don't benefit and you don't lose, which, yeah, that makes sense. If you never do the process, you don't lose anything on it and you don't gain anything on it. You break even. So that kind of makes sense. Now here we have a quadratic equation. So we're, we're going to get two numbers from this, much like with um, uh, much like with this here, where I point out how we're going to get two numbers, but we want the positive one, not the negative one. In this example as well, one of them will be positive, one of them will be negative. And of course, we want the positive one. So I'm going to start uh, by negating both sides, do times negative one on both sides, just to have fewer minus signs. That's not super important, but I just prefer to do it that way. Um, and I don't see a common factor. So, and, I, and also, I don't think this is going to factor nicely. So I'm just going to use quadratic formula. So x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So uh, negative 15, no surprise there, minus the square root 225, it's 15 squared, minus, well, 4 times a times c. Is that 16 times 6? Is that 9,600, I think? 4 times 4 times 600. Yeah, 9,600, and we, we have minus negative 9,600, so plus 9,600. That's 9,600 all over 8. So we've got a negative 15 plus, I forgot the minus because we don't want that one, of 9,825, which is not the whole number when you find the square root. So this will be some decimal. I get 10.515. So this is about halfway through the 11th month. All right, so that's that's how long we can maintain this, almost a year um, before we're just losing money and we really have to stop that, that process.
Anyway, those are some applications of definite integrals. Um, there's lots of variations that could be done. I think this one is uh, kind of encapsulates it encapsulates the the types of problems that are in the online homework. So that's why I chose this example.